Welcome back, everybody, to part two of Extra History's uh, look at the events surrounding the Hundred Years' of War. It's part of the history of England, which is a history that I've always been very fascinated with. Uh, just to respond to a few things, a few comments from yesterday. First of all, thank you, as always, to all the great feedback, to the comments, the questions, the observations. Uh, I do want to let you know that for those of you that have been asking, we will be getting to some history that is not centered on Europe or on North America. I, I do want to get into the series on Simon Bolivar at some point. I do want to get into some things like Bill Wirtz's History of Japan. The main reason I don't get into those as often is that, honestly, I just don't know enough about those. And if I don't feel like I have something of worth to add uh, in the commentary, then I largely tend to avoid it. I don't want you to just watch a reaction video of me saying, oh, wow, that's interesting the whole time. I want to be able to offer something. So um, I will get to those because I do want to learn more about them, but I just largely avoid them for that reason. Uh, it is Good Friday here in the United States uh, for those of us who are Christians and around the world, uh, if it's still Friday where you are. Uh, for those of us who celebrate uh, and observe this day, um, I hope you have a blessed Good Friday for our Jewish friends who are celebrating Passover. I hope that's a great time for you. And for everybody else, regardless of what you believe or don't believe, I hope you're having an awesome weekend. I hope you have a fantastic break if you get some time off of work or school. Uh, let's go ahead and dive right into part two. If you didn't see part one, there's a link in the description that will take you back. The Extra History of England. Once again, this spectacular tale will be told by David Crowther from the History of England podcast. And after last week's episode, Zoe and I have been debating all week on who's going to win this epic showdown between Edward and Philip. I'm glad it's piqued your interest, but why didn't you just research the answer yourselves? Well, Zoe not having opposable thumbs is a bit of a page-turning hindrance for one thing. But more importantly, we'd rather hear you tell us what happens next. Well, in that case, you two, allow me to fill you in. In 1337, Edward led a country of maybe four million people against the most powerful country in Christendom, a country five times its size. Edward was never to gain a reputation as a stay-at-home kind of lad. He was confident, bullish, aggressive, a warrior. He would bend the world to his will. Edward had a plan. In a letter to the Pope, he wrote, The best way to avoid the inconveniences of war is to pursue it away from one's own country. It is more sensible for us to fight our notorious enemy in his own realm. Edward would attack. He would follow the strategy of the chevaucée, a French word for raid on horseback. And this this idea that Edward had about not fighting in your own territory largely holds true for most of England's history. If you think about it, from the time of William the Conqueror uh, all the way up through the present day, there have really not been any enemy invasions of British home soil. Uh, you know, there have been fights between England and Scotland. Uh, but, you know, no outside. I mean, there's really never been a French invasion of England. There were no other enemies that invaded England. Most, Almost all the battles that take place uh, in Britain take place between fellow Britons, either England versus Wales, England versus Scotland, uh, English versus other English. Uh, but that's by and large true. All, pretty much all the fighting in the Hundred Years' War takes place in France. He would impose what he called fire and sword on the French countryside, marching on a wide 20-mile front a hideous wave of destruction and death, burning and killing everything in their way. His chevaucée would cause enormous economic damage. It would humiliate the opposing Valois King Philip and show Philip's subjects he could not protect them and that they should instead choose Edward as their king. Philip would be forced to come and fight a set battle where Edward was sure he could win, or at least that was the plan. Mm. England was small and insignificant, so Edward started by getting himself some big friends, including the Holy Roman Emperor, and the Holy Roman Emperor did not come cheap. But in 1339, Edward could march with his army into France, head held high, banners flying towards glory. And this is another one of those things that goes all throughout history, is that because England is small, comparatively small to some of the other powers uh, in, the, in the region, like the Holy Roman Emperor, the Spanish, once they all uh, consolidate into one power, um, the French... Uh, so what he what they're constantly having to do is ally themselves with Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor primarily, and occasionally with France as well later on. So you don't go into war with a country like France without having some friends because you can't do it on your own. 
And he has to do that. But being a small country, he also doesn't have the finances to be able to sustain a force. So he's got to take large amounts of debt to do this. And this becomes the main problem is that he'll win victories on the battlefield, but he can't sustain it because he can't financially keep going. In fact, his banners were flying towards humiliation and failure. The Holy Roman Emperor liked his gold very much. He was less enthusiastic about doing anything for it, such as supporting a balmy English loser. So he chilled out at home, spent a quiet night in with his gold instead. Edward's campaign of 1339 went nowhere. His useless allies had cost a fortune, and by 1340 Edward had a pile of debt so high he could hang glide off it. And he was forced to borrow more and more from Italian banking houses. In Gascony, the war was going badly. Worse, the French took control of the English Channel with a large, well-equipped fleet against which the English could throw up only merchant ships. Edward's councillors, his naval captains and his nobles told him he could not break the French blockade. But Edward was angry and would not listen. He snarled at his council, I will cross. And Now, you know, this whole thing with the ears, you know, that's something you think of kids doing. There's actually a history behind that, and it goes all the way back to, of all places, the Bible. In the Bible, in the book of Acts, there's a story. Uh, the first recorded Christian martyr is a guy named Stephen. And Stephen is preaching to a group of Jewish uh, leaders and uh, trying to win converts. And it actually says in the book of Acts that they covered their ears and shouted at the top of their lungs at, as they were starting to stone Stephen and they eventually killed him. Uh, so this whole la 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 thing that kids do. Adults did it all the way back in the Bible. It just has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I, th I happened to think of that when I saw that, that graphic of him with his fingers in his ears. And you who are frightened where there is no fear, you may stay at home. And so in 1340, the King of England, Edward III, against the advice of all his experts, attacked a navy almost twice his size, head-on, near the town of Sloys off the coast of Flanders. And surprise! To the amazement of France and all Christendom, Edward won. 18,000 French sailors lost their lives. But while Sloys was a great victory which gave England back control of the English Channel, success on land still seemed a long way away. The only way Edward could get the money he needed to carry on was by Parliament voting him a special tax. So Edward went to Parliament to ask for the money, but Parliament was tired of the expense of Edward's war and refused. And this was really one of the few things the king didn't have the power to do, was levy a tax. Ever since going all the way back to the time of King John, when you have Magna Carta, uh, where you have for the very first time the barons uh, or the nobles beneath the king um, asserting their own rights uh, to kind of, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, to um, kind of put limits on the king's power. Uh, the one big thing that came out of not only that, but out of... Um, folks like Simon de Montfort later on who were fighting against the king uh, is they were fighting for the right to have some sort of say in government and in decisions. And, and one of the big things that came out of those generations of uh, civil wars or revolts against the king was that parliament had the power to issue tax. But Edward would not give up. In two small battles in Brittany, the English achieved stunning victories against absurd odds. Edward had two advantages. The first was aggression and superior leadership. Edward was lucky to gather around him captains of extraordinary ability. Walter Manny, a wildly enthusiastic, aggressive and talented tactical commander who would charge into every battle with incredible courage and the battle cry, Manny, on his lips. Henry of Lancaster, a cultured man who would write a book called The Book of Holy Medicines, lamenting his misspent youth of wine, women and song and advocating the religious life, who was also a visionary military strategist and winner of another absurdly unlikely victory in the south of France. The Captal de Bouche, a Gascon, was the leading cavalry commander of his age. Together, these men around Edward would make history. So the reason this is important is because at this time, and actually well up until, I don't know, the last 200 years or so, uh, Military leadership was about who you were, not about how skilled you were. Um, if you had a title, you had power and you had authority on the battlefield. And so it wasn't necessarily the case that the cream rose to the top, that your best military commanders were the people that were running the show. It was who the powerful nobles were. But it just so happened in Edward's case, his powerful nobles that he surrounded himself were happened to be tactically very sound. And that made a big difference versus what the French were able to field. The second was that the English had taken the rule book of medieval military tactics, torn it into tiny, tiny little pieces, rewritten the rules, stamped on the tiny pieces of the old rules, ground them into the mud and danced on them. 
Every medieval army knew the battles were won by heavily armoured, chivalric aristocratic knights who sat on horseback and who by the sheer weight of their charge irresistibly smashed through any opposition. But Edward made English knights fight on foot. They did. And you know who learned how he learned that lesson? When his father got his butt kicked by Robert the Bruce and uh, even before that his grandfather fighting against William Wallace they learned that a uh, small army of men on foot could in fact defeat a larger army with large amounts of heavy cavalry if they used sound tactics and they were fighting defensively and they knew what they were doing so this is the point at which they've started to learn that heavy cavalry isn't an automatic win on the battlefield did not charge they waited for their enemy to attack them archers were set on the flanks and between the units of knights all other European armies used the crossbow because it needed little skill so anybody could be trained to use it. English and Welsh archers were armed with the deadly longbow. The longbow was a six-foot bow of yew, massively difficult to draw and requiring a life of training from boyhood to use effectively. And you know this uh, for a fact from archaeologists. They can actually tell by looking at bones of people from this time period whether or not they were longbow archers because there's actually indications in their bones that they had been archers because of the skill and because of uh, the the changes it made in your bone structure from a lifetime of pulling the strings on these arrows and firing them. Handily, that's exactly what they had, since in all the villages and towns, fathers and sons practiced every week. The longbow had a longer range than the crossbow hit like a truck and could penetrate all but the best plate armour. It had a much faster rate of fire than a crossbow. Each longbow could fire a deadly storm of six arrows a minute. Edward would teach the French that the most powerful weapon on the battlefield was a lightly armoured, low-born peasant. But Edward's cause looked lost. His debts were so massive that he defaulted, sending two Italian banking houses into bankruptcy. England had now been fighting for eight years and had very little to show for it, and Edward could find no one to lend him money. Worse still, in 1346, King Philip of France gathered a massive army and prepared to drive the English out of France once and for all. So Edward did the only sane and rational thing when broken massively outnumbered. He spent every last penny he had, raised an army and invaded. He landed in Normandy with a small army and a plan. He would burn and destroy French countryside as he marched north towards Flanders, pulling Philip behind him. And then he'd join up with the Flemish army and with the combined army turn, fight and destroy the French in battle. But as he marched north, he was in danger of being trapped by the rivers before he could meet the army of Flanders. And it was critical that Edward found a way. Look at what river it is, the Somme. Boy, where will we hear that name again someday? Over the river Somme. Desperately, the English marched, the French snapping at their heels. Again and again, the fords and bridges were held against them. And then one night, as the French were closing in, they found an Englishman living in France. And he told them of a secret ford marked by a white stone. It was called Blanche Tac. In the dead of night, the English slipped over the ford and were away. But the next day, disaster. The army of Flanders were not coming. The only reasonable thing to do now was to run for the coast, England and safety. But Edward didn't like to do the reasonable thing. And so, at a place called Cressy, without the Flemish, he turned his army to face the French. It was time to fight. To his son and heir, the 16-year-old Edward, known to history as the Black, Black Prince, Prince, he gave command of the left wing. As Philip marched his army towards Cressy, the roads were lined with friends shouting, Kill! Kill! On the 26th of August, 1346, Philip's army drew near the English force. The French were strung out for miles. Philip's best commanders advised caution. Put on those comfy gym jams the Queen gave you last Christmas, don the royal slippers, get a good night's snooze and let everyone catch up, then drown the English in a river of their own blood after a light breakfast. But Philip looked at the puny English army, now less than one third his size. He looked at the contemptible English peasants and their bows. He heard the cries of kill in his ears and he ordered the attack. A wave of crossbowmen came forward to soften the English up with thousands of bolts. But before they could get in range, the English bent, drew, fired and unleashed a storm. The crossbowmen ran or died. Furious, Philip ordered the cream of French chivalry to attack. As they thundered towards the English lines, they brutally cut down any of their own crossbowmen in the way, and the flower of French chivalry started to die. Even where the finest armour protected them, horses were vulnerable, and the chaos and screams of men and horses as the arrows struck home was terrible. Between waves of attacks, English and Welsh archers sprinted into the field, retrieved arrows, and thrust daggers <laughs> into the exposed eyes or necks of the helpless fallen French knights. Picture this for a second. This is how bold the English are in this battle. They're outnumbered three to one. Uh, the French think they've got an easy victory. These guys start 
unleashing their arrows upon them. Then they run out of the battlefield. They're stabbing these guys that are wounded with one hand with a dagger. These are archers. They're not armored at all. And pulling the arrows out with the other so they can reuse them and fire them again. Uh, one of the things I love about Edward III is that when every convention tells him to do one thing, he does the opposite. And rather than ending up suffering from the bad decisions that he makes, he ends up winning. He's heavily outnumbered in the English Channel uh, and wins that battle and takes control of the English Channel. He's heavily outnumbered at the Battle of Cressy and against all convention, he's completely out of money. He And rather than going home and suffering from a lack of victory and a lack of money, he doubles down on what he doesn't have already, goes into battle. Uh, he doesn't meet up with the army that he thinks he's going to meet up with, but it doesn't stop him. He goes in anyway, and then he wins. And there's a lot of foreshadowing with the Battle of Cressy, uh, with the battle that will come about 80 years later, or, well, no, I guess about 70 years later, uh, at the, the Battle of Agincourt, where, again, the English are heavily outnumbered. Uh, it's in the northern part of France, and, again, they win a stunning victory over a much larger French uh Force And again, they talk about the flower of French chivalry being broken at Agincourt. But the courage of the French was undeniable. The blind king John of Bohemia ordered two of his companions to tie their horses to his and lead him into the fray. All three were found at the end still linked together in death. And despite horrible losses, through sheer courage and weight of numbers, many French knights did make it to the English lines. Finally, there they could crush their tormentors. But the tiny contingent of English knights would not break. At one point, the young black prince was so hard-pressed that one of his commanders begged Edward to send reinforcements. Edward turned to his good parenting guide, teaching self-reliance section. Tell my son, this is his chance to win his spurs. The black prince was on his own, and the black prince did not break. Eventually, Edward knew it was time to finish this. As the massive French army milled in shock and chaos and pain and confusion, the English knights mounted their horses and levelled their lances, and the French fled and Europe reeled with shock at the news that the flower of Christendom lay dead in a field of blood, slaughtered by English peasants. So, yeah, great victories against all odds by Edward III, but this thing is far from over, and there are much greater uh, problems to come that have nothing to do with what happens on the battlefield for Edward III. So I hope you'll join me for those. Uh, I am going to be coming back with a second vi video later today, so be watching for that. Make sure your notifications are turned on. Hit that like button if you would. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.